Hi everybody, welcome to season four, episode 18 of the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast with me, Philip Eidson and Dara McAnthony, chairman and owner of Peterborough United. Um, Dara, you had a trip uh, over to Dubai, you're back in the UK now for the last few days going up the window. How's things? It's been a really busy seven days, been down at the club, spent a lot of time at the academy, um, you know, deciding on kids' futures, deciding mm-hmm. on, you know, 12, 13, 14 year olds, never never a nice thing to be involved in those decisions. You almost want to be a bit of a coward and go, you make the decisions in these kids' yeah. futures. Um, a lot of stuff going on at the club, uh, meetings with supporters, trust chairman, who wanted to bring me for lunch, went out for lunch with him, he wants to come on the podcast. I said, no problem, because it will help them yeah. try and maybe get some more supporters. Um, what else going on? Um, yeah, fucking bids galore, you know, whatever. Another one today from another player that we haven't had a bid for yet from a, mm. a, 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 a top seven championship side. And my answer was the same. I'll do business today, but I want them till the summer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Disdain. And it was like, no. And I'm like, look, yeah, of, of course, we have all this debt that everyone goes on about. And, you know, we have bills to pay, but I don't want to derail, you know, what everyone's working really hard to. So yeah. I said to the management staff last week, the plan's always been running. You're trying to get them back on loan. You know, unless it's an outrageous, and, and the manager understood as well, unless it's a fucking outrageous offer for one of the front players or whatever else, you know, we don't want to direct, not derail, but just be that club that suddenly, oh, fuck, you've lost one of your most It has to be players. worth it to do it. It has to be worth it. You know, we've lost Paku, obviously, for a few games through injury, mm-hmm. one of our first in front four, but Touchwood, we've won two games since with David coming in and he's done really well. So it has to be worth it. It's a fine line. It's um, People are saying you're going to be busy. You know, we like the prem with the financial fair player in a position where, you know, and we all agreed to this in the summer, you know, we have to be clever on how we 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 move in and move out. Our biggest problem is, is that we have two great young full backs in James Donnelly uh, and Harley Mills, left back, right back, and they're both fucking injured of all times. When you know we've lost PK, we lost the boy back to Chelsea. They would have had game time. They're training, but for, you know they're, they're the next level boys. Up yeah, there. they were ready, ready and primed to go. Ready to go, and they'll be they'll be the next starlets that will with a bit of hard work and the right personality from both of them have got a chance of being there with our first team the summer onwards. They've got they got talent. They have to do the rest themselves, but they've got talent yeah. and they get a chance. So, yeah, it's, it's one of them just juggling up and, you know, can we do this and can we do that? And we've left a couple of spots open. And, yeah, so there'll be a couple of things done, nothing major, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, and can we try and work out to keep the experienced goalie, you know, to back up Nico when yeah. he comes back from injury and maybe get Finn out on loan and can we do the wages on that? And it's the usual science of making everything. I'm still working on it. I've got to turn my computer to a spreadsheet <laughs> to make everything work, you know, whilst yeah. facing a financial hole of whatever till the summer. And yeah, it's it's the, the 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 love of running a football club and you know, but the bids are funny, you know, like it's not funny, but you know, to be fair. And it's the weirdest shittest window from a Premier League's perspective. So for us mm-hmm. to be getting the bids we're getting. And I've said to all these clubs, summertime, you know, or if you want to jump ahead of people in the summer, you can do yeah. it now. It's gonna cost you. But the player comes back yeah. and, and, you know, whatever. Because, you know, I don't understand in the way of players either, you know. And a couple of those moves were very lucrative for the players involved. Are you su- Does anything ever surprise you? You know, when you're getting these bids in, you're getting them from the championship. Um, are you expecting? To, to be fair, you always get to take the piss. But I'm going to say in defense of the people making bids, they've been fucking brilliant as regards to they haven't taken the piss. Yeah. Sometimes you get clubs, you throw in a bid and you're like, you're taking the piss. This is us. Uh, and they've been respectful of the fact that we we are that club you don't fuck with with derogatory bids. So they they've been very good bids. Not really what I not where I want. Yeah. But there's room to negotiate. But they won't loan back, so there's no negotiation yeah. right now. So uh, you know, from that perspective, that's a testament to the squad, to what we've done, to you know whatever. You know, I'm looking at all this Premier League, no money being spent, and I'm going, you know, the crazy thing, I think. When they sign under 21 players, it doesn't count towards their financial fair play. So you, I, I, I think I've got that right. I, if I haven't, I apologize. But you look at Newcastle and all these clubs and struggling for players and whatever else. Do you know how many talented under 21 players are in the EFL? Why aren't you buying them? If you're worried about your squad and talent and whatever else, why aren't you buying them? The other thing I would say to the Premier League in the EFL while they're doing this deal about new TV money, why don't you change the rules of Premier League financial fair play? that signing players in the EFL doesn't count towards financial mm-hmm. fair play. So if a Newcastle who can't go out and buy a, a French wing or an Italian wing or and shop where they want to shop or, or another club, forget Newcastle, let's call it who else can't do business because of financial fair play. Um, a couple of other clubs in there in the Premier Like Everton. Everton. 
but they can go to the championship and go yeah. and sign anyone from the chat there's so much talent in the championship even in league one that could play in the premier league yeah. yeah and the great thing there is is the trickle effect is in play which helps us right and this stupid financial fair play where they've all gone and blown their load abroad has now stopped the trickle into the efl yeah. so that doesn't help the efl so whilst we're no, negotiating that would be a great incentive wouldn't so it so while we're negotiating this new TV deal and new money and new whatever else that we're going to get done eventually between the EFL and Premier League, go in there and say, guys, why don't you change the rules for your whole Sky's new word is, I forget, it begins with P. They're using this new P word or whatever else to do with the spreadsheet and spending expenditure. And when Sky get a word, they use it every single day. And again, it's like, why not change the rules to adjust it that that doesn't count to it? You could go and buy five EFL players. Like Villa are trying to buy a young boy, I think, from, from Middlesbrough. I think they're doing that because he's under 21 and it doesn't count. But forget about accounting. Allow that to happen. And you would see a lot more money being spent on players yeah. in the champ. And that way then, and, and you know, that's the right way to do it. And, it's, it, it. and what it does is, is because I find it frustrating that there are clubs in the Prem who want to spend money but can't, can afford to pay their bills, can do yeah. it. And yet, of course, you don't want them spending a billion quid in a window and getting ridiculous and becomes a one horse race or whatever else. But to a certain extent, I, I agree with Simon Jordan on TalkSport talking about new owners coming in should have a bit more flexibility yeah. with financial fair play because you have yeah. to reshape a club. In defense of the Newcastle owners, you're going in, you're taking the club to the Champions League, you then want to kick on, you leave the Champions League stages early and you're back to square one and now you're suddenly, you've overspent and all you want to do is spend money on that football club. You've got a fan base who've had mm -hmm. years of Mike Ashley who want a bit of excitement. It's not like the Saudi money is going to dry up and they're not going to be able to pay their bills and it will be catastrophic for Newcastle. So there has to be a common sense applied where someone comes in and buys a new club, they have like a five-year exemption or a three-year yeah. exemption from spending as long as they're retooling the squad in the right way. I'm not talking about whether they're just buying players to stick on the shelf, you know, because yeah. you've got a squad number rule. But they can go out and buy players and rechange everything. So the squad's already got 20. They're allowed to go out and get 20 brand new players to replace the 20 mm -hmm. or 30, whatever. But they've got to change it. Because the other thing as well is we have to look at, the fucking transfer window's boring. We're actually killing mm -hmm. the entertainment and the business here. Mm -hmm. If this fucking continues, you know, I think last window, I think there was a billion quid spent and there's less than 100 million spent already. If that continues, Sky Sports will stop doing a deadline day special. Nobody around the world will be fucking interested and football loses its allure. That entail then means TV deals aren't as rich. Be careful what you wish for and be careful that you're going to end up hurting what is, I've said, a trillion dollar product. Yes, and you're not going to have a, someone's not going to go and spend um, a billion pounds on 11 EFL players, are they? So it's not like they're no. going to put themselves at financial no. risk in doing. But, but they might go and spend 100 million on five EFL yeah. players. Yeah. And the championship clubs well, might, be... the championship club might turn around and take that 100 million and spend 50 or 30 million on league one players league one might then go and spend 10 million of that on non-league and league two players win-win for fucking everybody right and what i'm i'm getting at is not going to break the bank for the premier league team is it correct and the wages are lower so what are you doing what are you doing i, I just don't get it you know this is like you people are all paid millions to make these decisions for fuck's sake what are you what are you doing stop mm. worrying about quotas and fucking being politically correct and fucking saving the climate and all the rest of it and get on with running your fucking businesses all right so let's go on to the field then so um since we last spoke um you beat shrewsbury 2-1 and crawley 2-1 so a couple of uh a couple of good wins i think shrewsbury may uh, have parted company with their manager after that so one as well. so so both games horrible conditions people go on about our pitch i thought our pitch was much better on tuesday because we'd had rain and the temperatures had changed the shrewsbury game um it was just the conditions. When we played them at their place, it was our gale force wind. Saturday was no different. It suited them. Yeah. Their goalie's one of the best. All the goalie did was boot at 95 fucking yards. And we mm -hmm. struggled in the wind. In saying that, we missed 15 fucking chances and open goals. So Didn't it was you have something like 70% possession or something crazy that I saw afterwards? We absolutely fucking did. We weren't at our best, but we, we should have won the game comfortably. Mm -hmm. We still won it. And again, we were 1-0 down. Uh, and then we come back and win. You know, so job done. They got rid of their manager. Not surprised. I mean, the football to watch at their place and whatever else. Yeah. That's not a slight in Shrewsbury. Terrific club. Glad they brought in a good, you know, no disrespect to the previous manager. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? It's, it was just route one. So, but each to their own. I can't judge people. They do what they do to try. But you have to, when you play that way, you have to get results. You lose six and seven playing that way, you're in fucking trouble. I'm going to so, talk about that in a few minutes' time. So then we go on to crawling. 
I saw the Crawley manager saying that fucking, you know, they absolutely battered us and did it, did it, did They had 50% possession, fair play to them. Ultra brave, mm -hmm. brave with the ball, wide open at the back. I don't remember our goalie bar one save having to make many saves. So whilst they had loads of possession, it was fur coat, no knickers. And we ended up missing again. We missed four open goals. Mm -hmm. We had umpteen chances and we probably played at 50% of our level. We made five changes. You could tell the squad players who came in hadn't played 21 games for two months because there hasn't been games on. So it was the lack of game time and they probably didn't do themselves justice. So I'm going to give them a pass because there hasn't been a lot of games and there's nothing like the, the being in the heat of the battle. Training's great and training games are great, but actually playing games and whatever else. So there's some promising performances, but again, we went 1-0 down, but you never, you know, worried and whatever else. But fair play to Crawley, balls of steel, play a certain way, won't change. I like that. Fair play to the fucking manager. It's brave to do. It's similar to what we do. And the first time somebody's had more possession than us. So that was an anomaly. But we're into the next round. We'll take the 40 grand yeah. prize money and move on. And we got Wimbledon on Tuesday. So, you know, you'd like to take it serious. A couple of games from Wembley. You know, all goes to plan. That would be fantastic. But you've got to focus on yeah. Wimbledon who aren't going to aren't mugs either. And they feel the same. So, and then Saturday, we got Lincoln. Brilliant club. Doing really well. Playing well. You know, another good test. And this is it now. You know, you're, you're on the run in. You know, we've obviously lost probably one of the, if not the best player in League One in Kwame. Um, but he's mm -hmm. going to be back sooner rather than later. And David's doing really well. Um, young Jadel's filled in for PK brilliantly. You know, and again, we're using the squad and, and, and we're doing the best we can. So it's not going to be Rolls Royce every single game. But what we are doing is we're going through a really horrific time conditions wise, trying to play our brand of football, which isn't easy on, on yeah. average pitches, shit conditions, carrying bumps, grazes. If you can get through that and get to a stage where the sun is shining, the pitches are flat, it's go time. So that's always been the key. And and the biggest credit I can give to the staff and the players is, you know, they never know when they're beaten and they won't change, you know, what they're doing and, and how they play. And, and, you know, long may that continue. It's a fucking joy to watch. And the biggest credit I'm going to give to our fans, because the Shrewsbury game, we had a pitch inspection. We were then told again to have another pitch inspection, even though it was playable. We then looked like obviously, you know, fucking morons or whatever else. But I was expecting a crowd if we were lucky. Fair play to the Shrewsbury fans who came. Half of them went out. We went out with the news. The game's on. We ended up with nine and a half. Our fucking crowds. I mean, I, 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 I'm so in awe of our fans, like showing up and showing up back to back games. It's not like it's every three weeks. We've had a lot of home games and the fans during a time financially where it's been shit for everybody are just showing up. And it's kind of like, I'm not that, you know, can't believe it. Well, I mean, the product you're putting on the pitch, you know, the helps. brand of football, it's helps. kind of the purest it's probably been for a few years. Yeah, it helps. It's that style yeah, it helps. Behind the kids. I, 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 I can't believe it. You know, the, the fans are just like showing out no matter what. The, mm. Everything I wanted them to be this season from a support point of view, even the fucking trolls who usually have a go at me, I think are pretty much kind of going, yeah, let's, let's, get on board and yeah. enjoy it. And yeah, they, they don't need to like me and they can still be DMAC out, whatever else gives a fuck. I've always said it's about what's on the pitch. It's about the management staff, the players. It doesn't matter about Darren McAnthony. It just matters about the club. So for that, I'm eternally thankful. And it's just been a joy to see. Uh, and a big effort for my staff as well, because they've had, they've been through the ringer with games on, games off, fucking, yeah. you, you know. So listen, we'll see where it takes us, but it's, it's, it, it, it's a joy to watch. So let's move on to yeah. Bradford, the mighty Bantams. Yeah, the not so mighty bantam uh -oh. at the moment. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I did I did see my partner on Twitter moaning during a game, and that's never a good sign. You were tweeting during um, a game. That's never ever a yeah, good sign. It isn't. <laughs> it's like, when, okay. when when you're surfing Twitter to try and keep yourself awake. Oh no. You know, during a game is no. never a good sign. What's happened? Give me truth since uh, we last spoke. It's so since we last spoke, we've actually we 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 were supposed to play Doncaster, that was postponed. Um we drew one all at Salford. Um you know, I think described as the most boring match ever, and I probably wouldn't argue with that. Oh, no. Um, so, confluence of factors probably, you know, trying to be generous, and you talked about conditions. You know, conditions have been awful. Yeah. Um, the pitch of Valley Parade has never been in the best conditions. In fact, that's one of the things Mark, Mark Hughes's only requirements was a good pitch. Oh, right. Um, you know, it'll figure everything else out around a good pitch. Did, well, did they fire the groundsman when he left? I, think <laughs> was, uh, I mean, to be fair to the groundsman, he did a walkthrough of the pitch the other day because, you know, you had um, every meteorologist on Twitter 
oh, telling God. us why the game should be on when it was called off because right. you know a couple of hours of sunshine is going to thaw out um you know days and days of frost doesn't work like so, that yeah so he was kind of walking through the pitch and you know saying essentially that oh the problem we played liverpool in the 21s in the efl trophy and there was a freeze about half an hour before kickoff right and so basically was saying and this is something that was new to me essentially when you walk on grass as it's freezing it kills the grass correct and so that's basically what happened is it killed the grass because all the players were playing as it was freezing correct and since then the conditions have been pretty dreadful and you know they haven't really got any better which happened to us just before oxford where the rain and, yeah. and the conditions like we killed the pitch in that game and then yeah. it takes time to get the pitch back with the weather yeah and the the game's coming thick and fast and so the pitch is a mess um the brand of football is deadly you know you talked about uh shrewsbury before i mean it is at oh, the no. moment it's route one to oh, the extreme yikes um and there's not really even any passages of play in the final third is that, is that, is that graham alexander's there. thing i think so mm. um and so you know you're looking thinking so we had this when phil parkinson took over you know take, sure. takes over a bit of a mess you know he's always a bit of a route one or direct let's say always uh, manager um, but went to the extreme just to try and get the best out of the players he had. So, right. you know, do you look at it and say, he's, Graham Alexander's dealing with what he's been dealt with and he's just trying to kind of get through the season um, and that, you know, he'll reshape it into like Phil Parkinson did a squad. That, Mark Hughes didn't play like that with these same players. So why would you play that? No, way? Mark, Hughes, Mark Hughes played completely the opposite. I think right. that's the, the, the struggle is the flip-flopping from one extreme to another extreme of style of play every single time we go okay. through a new manager. Um, but, I mean, I hope it doesn't continue like that. I, I, I've seen it, I've seen some fans are coming for Spark, Sparksy again, no? They were on Twitter. I think they were having a go at me and you yeah. for giving them an easy time. Yeah, um, you know, I get, I get abuse for, um, you know, trying to be what I think is a bit of a voice of reason sometimes <laughs> because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that, as you know, I've had the privilege of seeing behind the scenes at a football club, you know, through what we do. Sure. There's so many things that supporters don't get to see um, that do influence things that are out of people's control. Right. But on the other hand, you know, the final product is what they pay to see and it's been bad. And, you know, they don't really care about mitigating circumstances because a club like us, you know, should, you would hope not be struggling the way that we're struggling. And it's been pretty bad the last few games. Have you have you spoke to Ryan at all, or, or have you kind of I've, left him alone? Uh, yeah, I spoke to him before Christmas, um, but I haven't pinged him, um, you know, just over the last two or three weeks while things have been, um, you know, going back on the... I spoke to him at the end of the last bad run, so maybe maybe that will trigger a, a, a an about turn in form if I uh, give him a do, shout. Do you think they'll pull but, a Charlton and fire a second manager in the season? Um... I don't think so. I hesitate because um, I can't see him doing that because for his own, um, you know, reputation and um, and everything that comes with that, and you know how he's gone out on a limb to say about Graham Alexander being the right man and you know putting everything behind him. I think that would be a pretty um, pretty bad turn of um, you know about turn if we did. On the other hand, for us, season ticket sales are everything. And because of the club being run on this sustainable fashion, that's kind of what causes all this is everything is one year to one year. It's can we sell season tickets for next year to get the budget so that we can uh, self-sustain for another year. And the, I would say last night, or not last night, it was Tuesday night, there's maybe 7,000 there, you know, 8,000. Um, it was announced at 16 and a half because, you know, announced with all the season ticket sales. Um, but there's a lot of people that I knew that I am... Um, didn't go who would ordinarily go who were just like i can't do this you know i'm kind of losing <laughs> losing the will to sit through this kind of performance and not win right. on a cold tuesday night um and so it was pretty sparse it was by parade no atmosphere whatsoever it felt like a pre-season game right, for like fans, first round of the fa cup we need we need you to get through in that efl trophy we need the hard truth yep. final. we need the hard truth yep. final yeah <laughs> it's, like, it's gotta be bradford peterborough you know we need the final well, I, I think that's <laughs> The hope is that, um, you know, that's what's going to, one, bring some money into the kitty. Right. Um, but also, two, is um, give some signs of life for season tickets sales for next season. 
Gotcha. Now yeah. you'd say we've only got seven points, I think, off the playoffs, but those seven points look a long way away. Cheat. For the moment. Cheat, cheat, cheat. So, um, yeah, we will see. We brought Tyreek Wright back on loan, who was um, uh, the player that we had Plymouth. from. Yeah, so where was he before? He was Villa, then we did well on loan last year. We had a deal with him to sign him on a free, basically, and then Plymouth came in with just a huge offer from him from a, a wages perspective. Yeah. Um, but that's not really worked. Probably not surprisingly. It was a strange one, Plymouth coming and buying him. Um, and so he's come back for the rest of the season. Jake Young, you know, is still um, nursing a niggle, I say, with a, uh, you know, a skeptical smile on my face as we figure out what to do with him before the end of the window. What do you think they're asking for him? Obviously, Carlisle has been quite vocal about it, that you're asking for a lot of money. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe half a million. I mean, I don't think we ask, would ask for anything astronomical. Um, Carlisle, he can say what he wants. You know, he's obviously sour grapes that he's missed out on him. You know, he doesn't think that um, uh, for whatever reason, he's not going to go there. Maybe he will right at the end, you know, last minute. Uh, I'm interested, what do you think about Paul Simpson being vocal about another team's player and the valuation that they have. Yeah, that's always silly. I always find that I'd say to my own manager, shut up. You know, don't mm -hmm. talk about other people's valuations. At the end of the day, it's like someone said to me the other day, you know, oh, I'd love to buy like, you know, 1% of the posh. And I said, no problem. My valuation is 22 million. Mm -hmm. and they were like, oh, why would you value your club that high? I'm like, because I fucking own it. Yeah. So, you know, just because it doesn't suit you, that's my valuation. So if yeah. someone wants my player, like it, it was funny somebody wanted to buy one of our players and they were aghast at our price saying how, how can a small club like that ask for those figures and somebody mm -hmm. said to them, well that's peterborough that's what they do and that's what they get and yeah. you know we could take an hour to run you through the history of their transfers but you know you're not going to bully them into taking less than what mm -hmm. they think it's worth right. um so any manager that comes out and has a dig about your valuation no that, that's wrong so you you, you, you know right and it's not going to help you get a player all that's going to right. do is irritate that club. So mm -hmm. someone did that to me and they kept, you know, I'd be like, no, fuck off. Now the price is more. Yeah. So for an experienced manager, you know, maybe handle that a bit differently. But that's just my opinion. So look, yeah. he's, he's fighting a relegation. He's, he's, he's rebuilding his team and his owners are giving him the back in fair play. So I understand his frustration. He obviously wants the player. Uh, and yeah. I, I like what Carlisle are doing. But, you know, again, you have to play the game. I would say to my mm -hmm. manager, someone was like, don't talk about another club's player. Don't, don't, don't. Just, just leave it. It just, it doesn't make my life easier. It's going to antagonise the other side. Leave it alone. Yeah, Graham Alexander suddenly came out and said, "Not acceptable," and you know, I was surprised about this. And so, I definitely think it put a few backs up. Right, and, that, and, and, and that's where it goes. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, <laughs> it's always about who has money, who fancy, who needs a goal scorer. Um, you know, I'm hearing, um, you know, a club has, has sold a striker to the champ. Maybe they're going to need it, mm -hmm. and they're vying for promotion mm -hmm. in League Two. Maybe they're going to need a forward. Don't be surprised if they come in. I'll tell you after yeah. result of the pod who yeah. that is. I don't want to spoil that, you know. But I do know that they've got millions for a player that's going to the champ. So you know mm -hmm. they might need a goal scorer like him. So you never know. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that I'm resigned. Well, not resigned to him because again, he's not really done anything for us. So I, I think we cash in on the asset while he's got value. Uh, to be honest with if you, if you're in the top seven vying for promotion, I'll be saying play him. Yeah. Fucking play yeah. him. Get him in your team and fucking play him. He's the future. You might even get more in the summer if he wins the Golden mm -hmm. Boot. You know, yeah. so play him. So it'll be interesting to see. Right. So let's get away from being depressed. Sorry, what were you going to yeah. say? No, I was going to ask just more on transfer fees. Like, I think this is going back to Carlisle. So Carlisle now, new owners, you know, have made a little bit of noise about we have money to spend. How do you balance the, you know, the signals to the supporters that you mean business and we're going to invest versus you saying that and so you're putting it out there you've got money to spend and suddenly everyone increases the price tag on you that, 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 i've no problem with that the carlisle owners are doing the right thing what they are doing cleverly is they're sticking to their wage uh structure mm -hmm. i know that for a fact so whilst yeah. they might pay fees something like we've always done you yeah. have a wage structure so I'll, I'll, I'll pay you 200 grand for a goalie but say my wage structure is two and a half grand a week yeah. we ain't going above that so yeah. we'll buy the young goalie the goalie's on 1700 quid say at bradford and he goes yeah. you're on two and a half that's it yeah so they're they're holding firm and that way it protects the club from getting silly because you end up spending big fees and you bring players in on three four grand a week and you get carried away 10 of those players suddenly you got a wage bill where the club could be in trouble so the carlisle mm -hmm. owners are doing it in the right way there was the same we're spending money 
they're telling players and agents we're not paying silly wages yeah so you, you you know how do you stop clubs overcharging you can't you just have to get on with it we had that when i first came in they were calling me the irish abramovich and we were buying players and whatever else we had that every time peter rang. but we also knew cut the shit player ain't worth 500 grand we're giving you yeah. 300 and we'll give you add-ons that will make it 500. so you, you you have two words you can use when you're buying and selling players you can use the word yes and you can use the word no mm -hmm. or you can go fuck off so that's yeah. how it works do you know what i mean amazingly how many people struggle with that kind of philosophy <laughs> So something that's, you know, reared his ugly head this week has been racism again and two incidents with uh, Sheffield Wednesday and Udinese. Um, I was just reading before we jumped on the pod that uh, Infantino of FIFA basically said that in cases where that happens, the club should automatically forfeit the game. Disagree. Um, explain. Because what you're doing there, if you're going to blame a club, there's one thing having fans and you have to deal with fans and throw them out and ban them. And I think Milan did that. They banned them. But the reality is what you're opening yourself up for is what's to stop fans of other clubs in a promotion yeah. battle getting in as a fan and creating racism hell and yeah. ended up costing the club promotion and they're not really fans. I know that sounds like conspiracy theory, like, but you know how sports works. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, people will do anything. Right. So you're suddenly, so say that happens and you yeah. lost a promotion because you forfeited a game yeah. and then you got found out three months later, the five people who came in and did the racism as disgusting as it is, weren't your fans. They were planted yeah. there to win a promotion. They were yeah. planted there at the cost of your club. They were brought in as ringers. You know, you're not going to get your promotion back. You know, people no. could lose jobs. Now, you know, 100%, if that happens, you go in. Do you, do you know what I'd do? In the event that, you know, I, I would definitely say to a club, if it happened, you lose away crowd. You, your away fans can come to a game for X amount of games. Mm -hmm. You can you can take certain lengths. You can find a club. You can do whatever. You can, you know, potentially put them on a, a suspended sentence that might lead to they forfeit a game or they whatever else. But I, I'm not a fan of, well, you just forfeit the game based on five mm -hmm. fucking moron scumbags in the crowd giving it out. You know, fair play to the player who was brave enough and his teammates who left the pitch. Totally understand that and I get it. And in the 21st century, it fucking shouldn't be happening. And, and this is what drives me mad about when everyone was taking the knee. It's like, that's not educating these fucking morons. So what are we doing? How are we stopping this? How are we getting in? Are we, do, we, do we devise a system with money where we plant people around stadiums? And your job then is to pinpoint racists and, and, and pull them yeah. in the steward and go, right, yeah. gone. You know, do we, do, we, do we come up with a budget where you put, you know, 20 plants in every game, in notorious yeah. places with racism yeah. and spend time weeding them out because if you can't educate them you must eliminate them mm -hmm. so what do we do are we coming up with ways of that are we just going to talk about it are we just going to take knees are we going to carry on because these fucking scumbags exist they're there they're out there they ain't going away the only way they go away is we find them and we fucking get rid of them yeah and then the younger fans who are coming in show them what happened show them what happens when you go to games and you do this nonsense and you carry on with that you vilified you cancelled, you're done, there is no coming back. Five-year bans, I'm sorry, there should be lifetime bans. Yeah. It's a five-year fucking ban, and people get around that anyway. So yeah. that's my feeling on that. And if people mm -hmm. are quoting me on these comments, in full context, or I'll see your fucking ass. <laughs> well, it's definitely a, it's a societal problem, not, not, not just a football problem. It's, football's a vehicle. You know, that uh, doesn't mean that there's no responsibility on football to deal with it, but it's a bigger problem than, you know, a bunch of people coming to a football game. Yeah, you know, yes, it's a societal problem in sports and whatever else. I mean, uh, you know, again, I'll argue about people who say, you know, particularly on your side of the political spectrum, we go, it's worse now than it was 30, 40 years ago. I'll, I'll, I'll always argue and say, that, actually, I think we've come a lot further forward. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you, you think know. about the 80s, English football in the 80s versus where we are now. Bananas were thrown on the pitch, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, you know, look, there's no doubt racism exists. There isn't enough people, minorities, working in the game. I get that. I understand that, whatever else. And we can keep, you know, sprouting about it and talking about it and, 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 and virtue signaling about it, or we change it, or we come up with systems and we put things in play and we try and make it an even playing field and we all do better, or it doesn't happen. And that's what pisses me off. It's the, it's the people out there giving it the virtue signal. And then everyone who tries to disagree and, and say, well, no, I don't agree with you on that. And we shouldn't. They're called racist straight away. Calling somebody a racist every time they have an opposing opinion doesn't work. It doesn't solve the issue. 
it doesn't resolve anything and it certainly doesn't fix anything and if that's your go-to thing which lots of middle-aged white dudes nowadays their go-to thing straight away is you're racist yeah when you you know because they think they're on a, the political climate that we have they're, now. they're on an apology tour which is they don't really mean they're just trying to like play to the cameras and i don't believe them and anyone disagrees with them or tries to have an alternative view on it and say look we've got to do it this way you're racist get off yeah. your apology fucking tour and actually do something to help change it that's it all right so one more other point i want to bring up before we just do a quick round the leagues is um saudi arabia yes you know there's more noise about players not being particularly happy having to sit in their cars for too long on the way to training and oh, all these uh, you know all that money you get it must be tough, 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 tough. It's really <laughs> funny because Dean Holden messaged me three days ago. And I'm sure he won't mind me saying this. He messaged me and he said, um, I've been offered a chance to go out to Saudi as Stephen Jarrett's number two. I'm a bit like that about it and worried about it. And da 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 And, you know, what are your thoughts? And I went back to him and I said, here are my thoughts. Neil Critchley, uh, Ian Foster, and Michael Beale all work for Jared. have all ended up as managers, have all ended up getting great paydays, done really well. Take the fucking job. If you're worried about the crowd, worried about you, you shouldn't take the Saudi money and the wokeists out there. Fuck them. Think of your career and your family. Yeah. And do what's best for you. Ignore the noise. It won't affect your future. As shown by the people that went out there with him who've come back and got jobs. So my advice, get in a fucking airplane and get out there. His response mm -hmm. was, if I ever was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you'd, bum, you'd be my phone of friends straight away. <laughs> it's like so. so if he ends up going out there, I wish him the best of luck because I think it's a good move for him. And you have to ignore the noise. You know, like Jordan Henderson obviously got a lot of it. And yeah. at the end of the day, he's done what's right for him and his family. Like I said, when he took the money, do what's right for you. Ignore the noise. Ignore all the fucking virtue signal and assholes who take the money anyway. And who end up working for people that have Saudi money going into their businesses anyway. And it all makes a great talking point. Ignore those assholes. Think of you and your family. If it's right for you and your family, go and do it. And if it doesn't work out for you and your family, leave. And yeah. Henderson's given up a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. And he's left. Just the way it goes. Fair play to him. I've not no problem with Jordan Anderson did, and he's getting criticism. No, he's done what's right for him and his family, Phil. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't listen to noise that's going to affect something that affects your family. They're not going to be there when you need to pay your bills. No. Yeah? So fuck them. Do what's right for you and your family. Regards all the players where it hasn't worked out, Saudi was always going to be a long-term project. I still think mm -hmm. they're going to end up being a league. I always said to you, money talks and bullshit walks. They're going to get what they yeah. want. Yeah. And Saudi's mistake for me, their big mistake was great going out and signing all your name and your top names and whatever else. What did I say? Go out and sign some really good fucking EFL talent, young talent. You don't have to pay them millions. You pay the club's money. You get them out there. You make your league more competitive and interesting. Yeah. You'll grow eyes on the game. And it won't just be some 34 Brazilian, 34 year old Brazilian getting a 500 million pound payday. Go and get proper talent in your leagues. Change your rules where you can have more than one or two at a club where you can have half of the team with foreign foreign players mm -hmm. and go and get some young talent and make the product good. If you make the product good, people will watch. If people watch, it grows. That's how you do it. They went out there and spent the big fucking dough and, and signed your Hendersons and your Neymars and fucking your Benzema's and all these players who were like fucking dad's army in their final days, taking a payday. And I knew some of them would do it. Take the money, six months later, say you're homesick. Mm -hmm. You knew it would happen. Do it a different way. So the people running Saudi, give me a call. I'll steer you in the right direction. My consultancy fees won't be a lot. Yeah. And I'll tell you how to fix <laughs> your least, problems. At least relative to um, Ronaldo's salary, it won't be a lot. Listen, Ronaldo's the, the professional. He was never going to be like the rest of them. He'll do his yeah. two years because that's who he is. And then he'll probably go stateside. So, you, you, you know, you can't knock Ronaldo. But like I said to you, there's a way to do this. Ring DMAC. I'll solve the issues. It won't be as much as Neymar or Benzema. I don't need jets and whatever else. I'll take seven figures. I'll take the payments and I'll solve all your problems. I've also got an idea how you can get more English eyes on your product with a tournament involving lower league teams in England and teams in Saudi. I think will be a blockbuster for both the EFL and for Saudi football. The reincarnation of the Anglo-Italian I've, I've got a fucking unbelievable idea for it. Everyone will moan. The Athletic will be on my case. Everyone will be out with their fucking, you know, virtue signaling and whatever else. But this would help a lot of EFL clubs, which would make a great story for the Saudis if they're trying to get good publicity. Yeah. And I've got I mean, that's 
that's what this is. I mean, you like it, right? You like my idea, in pre- right? All the investment in the Premier League yeah. teams is all about um, Correct. sports washing, right. or you could allege it's about sports right. washing. So, what better way to do it than give the EFL right. some money? So, if the Saudis come in and solve the EFL's problems, you know, yeah. what a Premier League aren't quite doing what we need to do, and they end up we do a tournament between both of our leagues. All right, that will have a lot of eyes on it, and it will help us out. And it ends up being at Wembley, and ends up being at their mm-hmm. Wembley, and a two-legged thing. Uh, and again, it helps lower league clubs. You know, you ask clubs who can't pay their bills, who are about to go to the wall. Do you think they give a fuck about upsetting fucking journalists and, and the public? They want to pay their bills and help. So if you want to do all of that, if you want to do things the right way, uh, and you want to be a force for change and a force for good, well, hell, we have our own problems domestically. Come in and help. Yeah. I've got the solutions. Like I said, pick the phone up, ring DMAC. Uh, only a small <laughs> fine fee for hearing about it through the podcast. I don't ever use the word small, Phil, when I negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're doing the buying. <laughs> Correct them on now. Correct them on now. <laughs> Very good. So, um, what else we got you know, going on? The return of Ivan Tony. Yes. You know, we've yes. gone 35 minutes without talking about his return, but yes. bang the goal in his first 20 minutes. Yeah, um, absolutely. Fucking that's the moment. A little man. bit of a sneaky, uh, sneaky move of the ball for, um, their, for their free kick. A lot but... of bollocks. Everyone does it. We're talking about yeah. nonsense. It's on the news. A little bit like his comeback was a little bit overhyped. It's all bollocks. He's a world class player. Every team at the top of the Premier League should buy him and need him. I want to see Brentford win games. I want to see them stay in the Premier League. And then I want to see him get his move. Ivan Tony is in the top three strikers in the Premier League. Yeah. I'm even looking at Liverpool struggling at times and thinking, you know what? Sell Diaz, sell uh, uh, Gapco, and go and get Ivan. Him in the middle, Salah out here, Nunez to the left. Fucking league titles back to back, baby. So, you, you know, all day long. He is. Whew. Were you ever worried that he would come back? I'm not necessarily a different player, no. but, you know, not with the momentum, not no. with the sharpness. No. Um, no, he's. He, he would do something to him. Don't forget, I had him when he was even before his right. prime and his peak, and I know what character he is, yeah? That guy could carry so much crap on his back. That's another reason you buy him. What a player in your dressing room. All that crap going on, you think he would have fluffed his lines in that game, and he was fucking right. sensational. Sensational player. So underrated. Yeah, think, because people would give him five or six games or to get back into match fitness. Sensational. And I'm telling you. And all those things. It's sensational. United spent 60 million on a striker who was like 22 this summer. Ivan will end up scoring more goals than him by the end of the season. If Jim Radcliffe has any sense with all his billions, they should have already done that deal. Ivan Tony would be the face of the new Man United structure, and he would change everything and probably give them an outside chance to get in top four the second half of the season. You know, uh, and yeah, what a player. Well, the Liverpool train keeps on... Uh, unbelievable. Keeps on just uh, along, doesn't it? Uh, unbelievable. Jurgen 2.0. Um, what I always say, you have Jurgen Klopp, you've always got a chance. Um, I watched him against Bournemouth, terrible in the first half. I was moaning, crying, typical fan, bitching and moaning. Makes a few tweaks, go out and batter a fucking brilliant Bournemouth side. Uh, into the next round in the, in the League Cup now to Wembley. Um, watched that last night. Using young players, he's got loads of injuries, hasn't moaned. We've lost fucking four or five of our strongest 11, you know, and, 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 and still carrying on. So like I said, I mean, you know, top three, couple of trophies, and then we're a real force to reckon with next year. Man, I mean, you look at the... You look at the table right now, lost one in 21. Unbelievable. Scored, scored 47. Only Man City have scored more than 48. Conceded only 18. Do you know the scary thing? Uh, 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 there's so much upside. I don't think mm-hmm. they've even, like, I don't even think they've scratched the surface because you're still watching them and going, oh, not quite right there in midfield, not quite right there. And, you know, and the they haven't even scratched the surface. And he's got these young players. I think they're still going to sign the six in the summer. He's going to have a holding midfielder. You know, scary with the midfielder building. Curtis Jones is kicking on as a player. Bradley has been sensational. The boy that was at Bolton. That's going to give them so much opportunity if he keeps that up where they can put Trent in midfield. Mm -hmm. Liverpool could be, if they could crack it up front. I love Darwin Nunez, by the way. I hate people criticising him. What's a player? My only thing is Diaz and uh, uh, Gapko. Love Jota, love Salah. Them two, I'm not sure they score enough goals. Um, But I'm telling you right now, Liverpool 2.0 are going to be frightening. I still think Man City win the league by 10 points. I said it. I've Mm -hmm. said it all along when they're having their sticky run. But Liverpool are the force to be reckoned with with Man City over the next four or five years. And I think Liverpool win a couple of trophies this year and then we're back in business next year. If I'm wrong and Liverpool win the league, fucking I'll be delighted. I love a, a posh Liverpool double. Happy days. So, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're doing really well. 
Um, and then going into the championship, <laughs> right? I noticed somebody on Twitter asking about uh, if you could give them the lottery numbers after, I think, predicting that Southampton would go on the run that they have gone on. And here they are now third in the table and yeah. only one point off Ipswich in second. I, I, I'm going to go one further and say I think they're going to win the league. I think mm -hmm. Leicester haven't got a squad like Southampton. I think Leicester's owners need to back their manager. I think they're they're they're, they're struggling with certain losing players. Injury, the player went back to Chelsea. Watched them the other night. I don't think they're as dynamic as Southampton because they haven't got mm -hmm. that squad strength. Um, I think Southampton win the league. There's my next prediction. Um, mm -hmm. and, and Leeds won't be far behind them. Um, and I'm hoping Ipswich stay there because I've got a few Bob, obviously, and Jack Taylor if they go up. Um, yeah, they had a great point. Draws. They had a great point at Leicester, but I just see Leeds and Southampton could end up going one and two. So, um, yeah, I think there's a chance Leicester are going to drop out. I, I do if the Leicester if they don't do a bit of business. I think they've got the right manager. I think they've got a hell of a squad. I mean, Sky were getting carried away with the threat and depth about Leicester the other night. I just think Southampton and Leeds have the momentum. Uh, Leicester need to win two or three games in a row quickly to gather their momentum back. But I always knew about Southampton. I know Russell Martin. I know the way he is. You know, and, and the only question ever about Russell was conceding goals because of the way mm -hmm. he plays. But he's got he's had a bigger club than previous clubs. He's better defenders. They got good ownership. They they've managed their whole recruitment really well in the summer. Um, you know, uh, and I just see them going back to the Premier League, and they'll be a force to be reckoned with in the Premier League next year based on his style of play. So yeah, you know. I called yeah. it. I'm not always right, but I, I, I kind of felt it on Southampton, even with their where they were having those issues early on. It's just when you go in with a complete change of style, it does take time to 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 change everything. And I'll give you an example. The MK Doms manager, is it Williamson who went in, takes time mm -hmm. to change yeah. the style, and now they're starting to see fruition. Once it clicks, once you have the players, once you have the way and it gets across, you can be a force to be reckoned with. So, yeah, it's going to happen. And looking at the other side, um, Blackburn, it didn't seem like it was too long ago that we were talking about Blackburn for... Um, They've let their manager down. They've let their manager down. You know, they, and, they, um, they, they're a good manager. There's some good players. I think they need a heating to back in in the summer. Um, you know, the weird thing is their owners are quite wealthy. I'm surprised mm -hmm. because he, he plays the right style. He plays with younger players. They've got some terrific younger players. They've got Sammy who's scoring goals for fun. I feel that maybe they could have given them a bit more backing. And it'll be interesting to see how the rest of this month plays out. No, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, there's something, I don't have it in front of me. It would actually be interesting to refer to it. But I saw something go by on Twitter earlier in the week, which was a basically a chart of losses of championship clubs over the years, of the years that they've been in, and how much it basically costs to even fund a mid-tier a championship club. And, and ironically, I think you were there as uh, you point me to profit that was shown on the year that you were in the championship a couple of years ago. But, you know, it's not unusual to see annual losses of five, 10, 15 million Easy. plus, even more so Easy. in the championship. Easy. And I think that's the gap. You know, when, the gap. Yeah. Three or three are going down from the Prem went up last year and the three are going up potentially could have come down from yeah. the Prem last year. It's the parachute stuff. The gap, it's it, it's. It's enormous, you know, it's it's like it really is. And, and a quick shout out to my friends at Coventry who are now becoming my new favorite, you know, second yeah, third team. Who, playoff spot now uh, as well. uh, you know, absolutely magnificent. Love the fact that when they were in the shit at the start of the season, the owner, the manager, they stuck together, the recruitment, yeah. Dean Austin, who's there. Um, I love the business they've done. Um, I love everything about it. What they sold 34 million in players last year, they spent 18, 19. The beautiful thing about what Coventry are doing is a bit like us. We sell players, but we still spend. You see other yeah. clubs who sell players and they don't spend. Coventry yeah, actually spend, but they don't go out and spend silly on players on 30 grand a week. They go out and buy players like we, you know, talented young players, and they spend money cleverly. And, you know, that's a big club. The crowds, everything else, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, if Coventry got promoted, it would be fantastic to see after yeah. the years and the shit and everything else. And I've yeah. witnessed that where I've seen them go past us down. I've seen them go past us yeah. up. So... What Mark Robbins has done, he, he'd be manager of the year potentially this year. I know Russell and all those clubs and Ipswich, what they've done will get a lot of accolades. But again, the, the, the depression of losing a playoff final through penalties, to bounce back, to have a shit start, to get new players in, recruit, and then go out the other side because of the patience showing. Fucking love it. So, so, so this is always a debate within Bradford fans. You know, we look at um, all the, as we continue to struggle year after year in League Two, when we look at all these teams that go through such, um, you know, horrific, even um, 
uh, you know, experiences that may that puts the clubs at risk, and yet they bounce back, and then you see them become successful yeah. again. And here we are, still sitting, you know, seventeenth place in League Two. What are teams like Coventry doing, and Bolton, and you know, Northampton, even you know, who've been yo-yo, but have you know, in League, um, well uh, in League unbelievable one. what Northampton are doing. I mean, like, what do they do the way not? So, so what's the one common denominator? Northampton went down, same manager, yeah, come back up, same manager. Coventry went down from League One. Same manager came back up. Same manager continuity. They backed their yeah. man. They backed yeah. their man. Just like if we'd been in the champion gone down, Darren wouldn't have lost his job. I would have backed my man. Continuity. Stick to the message. Stick to what you want to do. This is who we are. This is how we're going to play. This is what we want to do. There's no panic, you know. Mm-hmm. And and those clubs you mentioned, like I said, that continuity of the same manager has seen them go right back up through the leagues. Coventry were in fucking League Two with Mark Robbins. Right. They were right. a kick away from the Premier League last year. Uh, and mm-hmm. it didn't take 10 years either. You know, they yeah. went bang, 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 bang. So, you, you know, again, a great advertisement for sometimes changing the manager isn't the thing to do. Maybe change the fucking players. Mm-hmm. So, Northampton. Yeah, Hampton, I guess it took, same, you learned that, right? You've talked about learning that and making mistakes. I did learn that. I, I did a breakfast meeting with all our sponsors the other day, and it was a great meeting. It was like 40 of them. And they were talking about it, and I just said, like, you learn. I fired Darren years ago when we had a sticky run after, you know, we'd nearly won the, you know, we won the AFL trophy. We were in the playoffs then the following year, but the team had been together three, four years. I should have changed the players, not the manager. Sometimes as a club, if you're strong and your conviction, your beliefs and whatever else, stick to the plan. Uh, 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 and I'm not going to say trust the process because my kids kill me, but like, you know, enjoy the process. So, you, you know, don't use that as a title on our episode either, but any words process in there. Use use the word sparks fly for bad for <laughs> there's, there's no process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't use that either. No process. Don't put the word process in any title on our podcast. So the point is they all stuck to, stuck together. They all came back. They've all enjoyed it. Um, you know, fucking hats off to Doug at Coventry, to Dean, to, to Mark. You know, hats off to Northampton. You know, um, yeah, obviously, there were their owners out in the States like me, Calvin, mm-hmm. and his partners and, and John Brady. You know, phenomenal. Things you love to see. So I've always said that, you know, I, I, I don't want to see Cambridge, Northampton go out of League One or struggle. I don't want to see them pit bulls either for, like, promotions, mm-hmm. but I don't want to see them. I want them doing well because I want them growing because I want our crowds growing and that rivalry yep. growing. You so, want a healthy rivalry. Yeah, I'm not that guy who's, oh, they fucking lose. Doesn't work like that. So yeah, interesting. Fucking good point you've just named there. All right. So let's go. Uh, a couple of things in yeah. League One. Yeah. So uh, Reading. You know, we yeah. talked about obviously the protests. Great win uh, the other night. Ago. Great win. So um, the sanctions that have come down have essentially been um, a replay of the game and a suspended uh, sentence. Like I said last week to the fans, don't hurt the team. The team yeah. are fantastic. Don't fucking be the reason they're not in League One because they've got some good players. Um, fucking beat Derby the other night. Great result. I know mm-hmm. Mugs. We took four points off Reading this year. They're going to be four good points because a lot of teams are going to drop points against Reading. So that did not shock me. That result the other night. Now, how would you feel about the 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 demand? Well, demand the the replay of the game if you were a, a Port Vale fan or a Port Vale owner. What was the score? Um, I think it was nil. Wasn't it nil nil when they? Okay, um, I, I'd have no problem. Yeah, I'm not blaming the club. You know, I'm. I'm. You know, if we're three nil up. And Reading fans came on our pitch and stopped the game. I'm demanding we get the three yeah. points. If it's nil-nil and it's 20 minutes or whatever it is, I'm like, replay the game. I have no problem with that. I've yeah. always thought when 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 games are like people are winning a game and there's like seconds left or minutes left in games, you should get the result or go replay the five minutes behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, I've never believed that where people lose goals, lose whatever on, on something that stops a game. You know, I think in Spain, they play the replay the game. Real Madrid once won a title by replaying a game with eight minutes injury time. Beyond yeah, we, yeah, and they needed to score. I remember back in the day, we, we, had a, we were losing 2-0 in a game, and the fog came with five minutes and you And you won the replay game. And I think we drew, but it was... Bullshit. You know, Bullshit. Bullshit. Those rules have yeah. to change. So I'm delighted for Reading fans. Fair fucking play to them. Um, so the other one in League One is Michael Appleton. So Charlton have sacked Michael Appleton. Uh, they already made a couple of moves in the transfer window. And obviously, we we'll, we talked on the pod about their interest, uh, at least earlier in the window, in Johnson Clark Harris. Um, what are your thoughts on sacking a manager midway through the window, having well, already made signings? I think they sucked in three minutes after that fucking game the other night. So yeah. it's weird because I was speaking to the CEO, Jim Rodwell Rodders, who worked for me um, a couple of weeks ago, and he was going on about how similar that Michael was to Darren. 
Hence why they mm-hmm. came in for Darren and when he got Michael. I was thinking at the time, but Michael hasn't won any promotions, so I don't know where the comparison came yeah. from. With all due respect, my manager doesn't get that ultimate respect he should get. Yeah. Um, five promotions and trophies. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised. You know, they're obviously having a sticky run. They're losing games. They're obviously backing them. They're, they're bringing players in from all over the place. I'm not a big fan of eight, nine signings in the January window. Mm-hmm. I don't think that solves a lot of problems. Um, I think they're getting Nathan Jones. Good appointment. Okay. You know, he won't be cheap. Um, yeah. You know, proven winner at League One level. So, yeah. like I've always said, Charlton's a monstrous club. They'll be on the up. They'll only be a matter of time, you know? Just... Yeah, I, I guess maybe your opinion on your manager changes once you see that somebody else is available who appears more attractive. Sometimes the grass is always greener. But see, side, I, I, I think Appy, Michael Appleton's a great coach. and I, I think it was harsh. Yeah. I think you bring in players to change things, it's harsh. So, you, you know, but who am I? Look, they've got 12 owners. They've got all their, the ex Peterborough people there. They know what they're doing. Yeah, we talked earlier about uh, you playing Lincoln uh, next. So Harvey Jabra, who's the um, one of the investors in Lincoln, is now another American owner, taking majority ownership. Oh, uh, fair play. Didn't know that. Fair play. Yeah. Fair play. Well, um, I hope they celebrate that after we've been there and, mm-hmm. and done okay. So fair play. So Lincoln's, yeah. this, Lincoln's one of them well-run football clubs. Always has been. Yeah. The last Since they've come back into the football league, they're the good CEO, good ownership, good people behind the scenes, well-operated, well-run. EFL wants clubs like that all the time. So welcome to the new owner. Uh, and yeah, you know, brilliant. Good for them. And, and talking about ownership changes in League Two, Hugh Jenkins. The Seen that. CEO Seen that. Yeah, for, Hugh. Yeah. Wasn't. Exciting for um, Newport. He must, he must live nearby there to have gone and done that. Right. He's a wealthy guy. I was thinking Newport, you know, it must be something that's close to where he lives. He missed There's always been rumors of him coming and having an interest in us as well. Uh, well, you know, wealthy I think guy. A couple of years old, wealthy but, guy. He'd have been. He'd yeah. have been a great coup for Bradford to get as an owner. So yeah. look at his job at Swansea. He did a great job. Right. So if you're a Newport fan, you got to be excited. You know. Yeah. So listen, Hugh's first phone call should be: I want Johnson Clark Harris to spearhead Newport mm-hmm. to the championship. There you go. <laughs> um, and well, he put in half a million, I think, for fifty-two percent stake. What a um, fucking bargain! His- um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of debts underneath that to um, or gaps to fill. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't tell the whole story. But, um, you know, it's interesting when you go backwards and forwards and talk about club valuations. You know, that's yeah. ultimately valuing the club at about a million. Um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, there's more to that than meets the eye. So yeah. so there's no way Newport's just a 500 grand acquisition. It's a good football yeah. club, you know. So I would imagine he's committed to spend millions more over the next few years as part of that mm. deal to take over. But he's a good owner. Good luck to you. And, and maybe that Johnson Clark Harris spot has been taken by Luke Jeffcott. So I saw that he signed from um, St. Johnson, ex Plymouth. Right. And he's always a one that I thought would go on to better things in his mm-hmm. career, but it just never seemed to happen for him. He had a good, maybe it was just he had a good, you he had know, a golden year patch. He yeah, he had, he had a golden patch. I think the year John yeah. beat him in the golden boot race. So, you know, I think um, Ryan Lowe got the best out of him for a period of time. He's not the quickest, yeah. is he? So, but good luck to him. It's not really worked for him. As no, and I saw Troy Deeney, obviously, he left for our screen. Yeah. I, f- I forgot to ask you last week about his um, shouting out. He, did, his he, he didn't like those veggie burgers. They obviously sent them, <laughs> sent them, you know, way OTT. Yeah, you know, he, ill-advised, poor, the stuff he said, you know, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of sometimes I've done that in the past, but I'm not the football manager. So, um, you know, I thought, oof, he's in the Joey Barton club of probably not getting a job again. You know, yeah. for the stuff he said, because you're looking at that and you're looking, you know, he's on Sky the following day. And, you know, again, I'd say, is Troy want to be a Sky pundit or does he want to be a manager or a coach? Mm-hmm. I used to say that about Hasselbank, who was in the studio. I don't want to see yeah. my manager after a call out and after a loss sitting in the Sky studios the next day. I want him yeah, at my training ground. Yeah, I, not for me. But I, I do I see him as a manager? Mm, not sure. So, but I, he hasn't helped himself. And, you know, obviously, uh, that's that's a that's a him problem uh, and a Forest Green problem. I think they've just hired Steve Cottrell. They did, yeah. Um, what does that do to the dressing room when a manager so blatantly calls out individuals in the press? Um, it's problematic when you when you get that personal. You can call out players, and my manager's done it the odd time, and 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 he's regretted it. But when you get personal, talk about the boy that was at Luton. You talk about yeah. you, you know Reese Brown who we had, yeah. you know, and and you get personal, that causes a real fucking problem. The dressing room's gone. So the ownership mm-hmm. has to go. We'll stick with a manager and get rid of all the players. And, and Joey Barton used to do it all the time. I never understood why he did it. Because eventually it smacks you in the face. 
You know, you need that. You have to rely on those players. So I get with some players, you have to motivate them. So you're challenging them. Yeah. But to get so personal, like Joey's done it, like when we beat them, they, you know, at our place, he did it on the winger. And then Troy's done it. Look, he's new to management and coaching. I'm very surprised that he did that because he was captain. He was Watford. He, you know, he was in charge of a dressing room. He's mm-hmm. one of those people. I, I'm amazed he did it. Um, you know, and, and my advice to him w- would be, you know, you're probably going to have to go in and be a coach somewhere. Uh, mm-hmm. and do some hard yards before you become a manager or get an opportunity again and rebuild, you know, the public perception of you as a manager and where it went wrong. Yeah. So that's if he wants to do that. Now for the players involved in the dressing room, will it, either, will it ostracize them further within the dressing room or will it kind of will it bring the, the rest of the squad around? I, 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 I can't speak for the dressing room, but I would imagine being a couple of those players, you'd feel embarrassed by everything that was said. Yeah. So. You know, let's see how Cottrell gets on. You know, he's a very experienced manager. I, I would say he has a fighting chance of keeping them up. Because they've got some good players. It's been a strange, you know, they in in League Two, they probably spent two, three, maybe four years being up up there and about there and being competitive um, to then just fall the way that they fall. And I'm not sure if the money stopped or what's happened. But it's well, been whatever, a bit of whatever a, they've rang us about it, whenever they've rang us about a player, they've always said to Barry, oh, we don't have the money for those wages. We don't have that. Which always surprised me because Dale Vince is fucking richer than most owners, including mm-hmm. me, in League One and League Two. So I guess it depends on how much he wants to put into a football club. Yeah. That's his. That's a him problem, not a my, me problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, there's the title. That's a him problem. We've used that a couple of times already. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do just before we wrap up um, because I think that probably um, for good reason that Chesterfield are doing so well in the National League. Oh, you know they fuck are yeah. cooking. Points, what are cooking. thirteen points? I've got them cooking. <laughs> yeah. this is just like... they're, they're walking it. And I think maybe there's a little bit of jealousy of the uh, the attention that was put on Wrexham and Notts County last but, year. But, but I, I would agree. Uh, I would agree. I, I, you know, and you're allowed to get you're you're allowed to get irritated with stuff like that. I mean, they've been there thereabouts the last two years, and obviously yeah. even last year they were in with a shout. And Paul Cook's done an amazing job, and they're up, they're winning the league, yeah. and they're getting no credit for it. Regards to public perception, you know, the Athletic do two articles on Wrexham every week. They practically mm-hmm. jizz all over the desk writing about Wrexham during the week do you know what i mean that's what they do it's like whoa, they're worse than espn you know what i mean mm-hmm. so and, and it's amazing you know i don't think there's been and i apologize if i'm wrong an, an article on chesterfield in the athletic right. you know what i mean so i get it totally you know because you know we we had what happened to us in the playoffs last year we had a lot of horrible press about the financials and you know we're the youngest team in the efl and if you look at all the metrics the statistics the things we've done and whatever else and nobody really has spoken about that you know certainly not the athletic do you know what i mean yeah. like whatever else and maybe that's a good thing maybe when it's all said and done and you succeed and you achieve something then you can go you know what everyone ignored us Fuck them so you know fine but i think chesterfield to win 13 in a row at home or whatever it is and mm-hmm. you know to be so far ahead i think they're doing a disservice to paul cook because he's a very accomplished manager you know, at a bad time at Ipswich, he's dropped down to do a favour to someone at Chesterfield. Equally, Stockport probably don't get a lot of credit. You know, they've had some right. stuff written about them, but what a job they're doing in League Two. But yeah. the biggest one, and the biggest one for me is Mansfield. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a lot of time for the Mansfield owners. Barry told me at Wembley, their family were so upset when they lost in the playoffs, and it was such a kick to the, to the stomach. Yeah. What Nigel's done there, you know, if Mansfield end up going up autom- automatically, and I hope they do, because we have a bonus on Pimmy. You know, again, what a fantastic story because they've had so many years of disappointment, Mansfield. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of like, again, great story, but not really spoken about it. Not really the money in. about it. It's like, you know, well, yeah. Wrexham are second or third. So let's just keep, yeah. you know, we all know the Wrexham story. And, I, and it's really funny because you've got some great Wrexham fans that come on my timeline and go, oh, we're on TV again. D Max going to fucking hate that. So <laughs> I, I like the fact the fans are bantering with us. But let's get something yeah. straight. Wrexham will be in the championship in two years, three yeah. years max. They are inevitable. Wrexham are inevitable. They're now a big club. They're going to have 20,000 in their stadium. They'll rival Bradford for season ticket sales. Yeah. They have billionaire owners. 
They have the capacity to outspend everyone in League Two and League One. Huge brands putting a ton right. of money into that. And, and what what they've done is, in fair play to their owners, they've got their community in it with them. They haven't just gone in and spunked all the money. So the one credit I'm going to give their owners is they've embraced the community. They've worked on the community. Their staff have done a great job. They've put money into. It. I can't criticize them or dislike them because they've actually spent money in the right places. Yes, they fucking paying ridiculous wages or whatever. But they've spent money on the ground. They've spent money on their fans. They've spent money in the community. They've done all the right fucking things so as inevitable as they are to be in the champ in three years time they will deserve to be there but yeah. there are smaller clubs who are doing it in a shoestring who deserve attention too and that's all we say share the love share the yeah. share the uh, adulation when a club does well don't just go for the don't go for the hollywood sales all the time you know share the love and as much as you know it pains me as us being down in 16th but you know the York at crew again, kind of bouncing back. Brilliant. They've, you know, you always think, well, that was, you know, they've run out of the play, the young players now, and it's they're going to struggle. They keep on bouncing uh, back. Uh, 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 hey, I'm going to give the know, athletic they're... credit because I've slaughtered the athletic all the time because of their dislike for me. They did an article on Barrow. It was a great article. They yeah. spoke about the recruitment. They did an American owner. I didn't realize yeah. that. Who's he's he's not American, but he's based in America. He's British. Yeah. You know, the, the the team train 100 miles away. Yeah. You know, what they've that done, the style of play with Pete Wilde uh, and Athletic have given Barrow, you know, their due for what, what they've done. So I'm going to give the Athletic a bit of credit for that. And um, Harrogate, you know, eighth, ninth in the league. Again, I look at us down in 16th. Harrogate, another one you keep writing off. They can don't have done. any money. It can be done. Talked before about continuity. It can you be know, done. Talk about continuity. That's what they've had. And, um, it doesn't necessarily, I think that's what's frustrating for us all. It doesn't necessarily need a ton of money thrown at it. It just needs good management. Um, yeah. You know, from the top to the bottom. What do I always say? Best in class. Yeah. If you can get best in class in place, you'll fly. All right. Well, let's leave it at that for another week. Um, good luck um, on Saturday. And to you, who have you got? We have got, let's see, you can see how demotivated I was by it all that I can't remember who we've got. <laughs> um, we've got Swindon away. So, uh, you know, talk about a team in, like, we're, we're grumbling about ourselves, but uh, I think Swindon have got even more troubles with their ownership at the moment. So, uh, yeah. We oh. usually do okay down there. So that's my yeah. famous last okay. words. Okay. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs> all right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.